I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse in the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. Do 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 do. Do, 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 do. What is that? The Star Trek theme, David? No, the Star Trek theme goes bum 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 bum. Or, or the only good Star Trek theme. There's other ones. There's that like weird the, the original one. Oh wait, that's bad. Cut that out. Da 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 na na da da da. Yeah, what do you think about that? Pretty good, pretty good, not bad. So today we're going to talk about composers. That's right. All right, so what are we really talking about, David? L- last week you alluded to looking up at the sky. Yeah, and you alluded to being out of this world, so maybe you should just reveal to everyone exactly what we're doing here, since you've already given it away. Yeah, okay, I, c- I could tell you were a little bit uh, upset that I kind of spoiled the topic, but... You know, we've been reading articles about satellites and countries trying to vie for their position at the top of those who are dominating space. And, you know, space is a fascinating realm in the context of the very many political games that our major countries play against one another. I keep reading these articles, David, and it's fascinating to me because, you know, right now the major world powers are jockeying for control and dominance of Earth's orbit. But it plays out completely different than it does on land. For one, there are no borders in space, right? There's no geographic borders anyway. On land, you can say, our country is between this river and that mountain. And anyone who crosses this line is in deep trouble. But in space, satellites circumvent the entire globe. If Russia tried to park one of their tanks next to the United States White House, or, you know, China maneuvered an aircraft carrier into the Gulf of Mexico, we'd practically be declaring war at that point, right? But in space, a Chinese satellite might just pass by an American satellite every single day. And another interesting thing about this dynamic of countries vying for control in space is that, as we'll get to, there's not always a clear difference between a harmless space probe and a satellite-killing space weapon. I think, Daniel, as far as I'm aware, that space is supposed to be entirely weapon-free, that there's a lot of treaties and stuff that we've agreed uh, more or less to this idea, but uh, you're making it sound like it's the Wild West almost. It is the Wild West, David. We have no idea what's going on in space. And, you know... No idea at all. That will, like, uh, maybe you've seen that, that glowing disc that rises some nights. No idea what that is. No idea. It's all uh, up for grabs up there at this point. But besides that, David, when I read about all these countries competing with one another, as serious as the topic is, uh, these satellites and these weapons and all that, I can't help but laugh just a little bit. Laugh? At the comic nature of it all. The vast and endless vacuum of space. Quiet. Ancient and somehow conveying awesome power. In the distance, the unwavering soul. From where we are, 35,780 kilometers above the earth, the sun appears as big as a dime. It is in fact a perfect ball of hot plasma 1.4 million kilometers thick, projecting rays of light into the infinite and ever-expanding universe. A faint, blinking light approaches. The calm and slow approach of a small object is in fact a 3,000 kilogram telecommunication satellite cruising at 11,300 kilometers per hour. Its size and speed made insignificant relative to the scale of our solar system, itself a mere drop in an infinite ocean. Let's accompany this telecommunication satellite.
We float on, unassuming. But then in the distance, another object appears. This new object is a geostationary satellite. It orbits the Earth west to east, traveling at the exact speed to remain in the same position relative to the planet's surface. It must have detected the approach of our telecommunications satellite. And in response, and ever so subtly, arc jet thrusters attached to the satellite heat gas molecules via electrical spark and then In the frictionless vacuum of space, the absolute tiniest application of force is enough to alter an object's course. And so, ever so gently, these two objects approached one another, one inch at a time. Also attached to the approaching object are three large disc antennas. They point directly at us, staring at us, approaching us. Like a cat that stalks its prey, we are being listened to. We are not following a geostationary orbit, and so, after a moment, the distance between us and the other satellite begin to widen. We are leaving it behind, but its creepy eyes keep staring, staring, staring. On Earth, chaos. Trying to listen to your neighbors is not only unfriendly, it's an act of espionage. Were you trying to listen to us, sir? This means war. Due to recent developments, our country is forced to announce the creation of space marines. Our space marines will not tolerate such disrespectful interference. They won't take our freedom. To demonstrate our superiority, we are launching missiles at our own weather satellites. To demonstrate the unparalleled skill and ruthless determination of our scientists and engineers. You are listening to AA247 News. In other news, 30 million Americans have declared medical bankruptcy and have been forced to sell their few remaining cancer medications on the black market. Over to you, Dan. Yeah, so uh, that makes me laugh a little bit. That's the kind of image I had in my mind when I was reading all these articles, David, about countries arguing with one another about who's violating who and who's declaring war and, and who's uh, uh, invading our territory out there in space, right? So, for example, David, on March 18th, 2019, the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency published a document titled Challenges to Security in Space, in which it calls out Russia and China as the two biggest threats to U.S. space operations, claiming that China is second only to the U.S. in the number of satellites orbiting the Earth, while both Russia and China are apparently developing anti-satellite and counter space technologies. From the report, quote, some actors are seeking ways to deny the effectiveness of the United States, having witnessed more than 25 years of U.S. military successes enabled by space capabilities, end quote. And then, uh, around the same time that that was published, I believe it was also March of 2019, the U.S. Missile Defense Agency requested from Congress around $300 million for the 2020 budget so that they can develop more advanced missile defense technologies like lasers and, more significantly, a working neutral particle beam, which they hope to place in orbit by 2023. David, do you know what a neutral particle beam is? Is it like a neutral milk hotel? And, and a what? That was a clever joke about a band, but I guess uh, I'm too cool for you. I'm not from Brooklyn, David. I don't listen to... The band's from the South, Daniel. David, I'm not from the South anymore. Oh. As of four, like three or four weeks ago, I'm a Yankee now. Uh, I don't think that's how that works, but uh, I actually do know what a neutral particle beam is. I mean, it's kind of like a laser, but instead of shooting light, 
It shoots atoms at its strips electrons away to get this neutral charge, and then it carries energy in this beam of uh, adjusted atoms to wherever it's going to be going, more or less, to, to vastly simplify it. So basically, it's, it's a machine gun firing atoms yeah. in space, I, most likely. Yeah, I guess so. Either stripping those atoms of electrons or alternatively adding electrons to the atoms, depending on you know, how you're trying to uh, adjust the, the particle beam. Yeah, well, the, and, and of course, the atoms are stripped of the electrons because the beam part, right, is an actual beam. It's firing these atoms in a very small laser-like direction, and charged atoms would merely repel each other, right? You don't want that. You want them to be uniform in this beam so that when it hits the target, it could be another satellite. It could be a missile being uh, launched from Earth. It very quickly melts the hardware, gets inside there, and dismantles the thing. That's pretty cool, I guess. All right. Well, you think that's cool, David. Let me give you another thing that the United States has been working on. And this is called Rods from God. Uh-huh. What do, you, what do you think? Do you even know what a rod from God is, David? I do, in fact, because I'm the one that told you about it. But um, for the sake of the joke... Uh, it's when you drop uh, leaflets with rod flanders from space onto Earth. That would be truly terrifying. But no, it's not quite that terrifying. Well, that rod is specifically the rod from God because of its devotion to Jesus Christ, our one true Lord. Let me give you a hint. So during the Vietnam War, the United States experimented with a weapon called lazy bombs. And these were bombs, or they were shaped like bombs. You know, like you've seen like the comical image of a bomb it kind of looks like a fish with the fins but it's all metal and it drops a payload well they built these to a one inch scale very tiny i mean these are things that would fit on your finger right and then they folded some sheet metal and our military welded that sheet metal fin to these one inch bombs and then they dropped them by the thousands on people in vietnam from three thousand feet in the air and the idea was that as these things fell, gravity accelerated their velocity. And by the time they hit Earth, they were penetrating with such force that they could go nine inches into concrete. And they would often penetrate human skin and leave many people dead as a result. And we took this idea and we kicked it up a notch and said, what if we did the same thing, but we dropped it not from 3,000 feet, but we dropped it from space, and instead of a one-inch little bomb, it was a 20-foot telephone pole made of solid tungsten that when it hit the Earth, it caused an explosion comparable to a small tactical nuclear bomb. That's Rods from God. This reminds me of a quote from a video game, actually, Daniel. Uh, th it's also about uh, space warfare. It's from uh, Mass Effect, Mass Effect 2. And uh, there's a very short scene where uh, these new recruits are being taught for the first time how to fire a uh, mass projectile. And what this trainer is emphasizing to them is that if they miss firing this projectile, and it's, it doesn't have any explosives or anything, it's literally just like a ferris slug, then uh, they are going to fuck up someone's day at some point. I'm, I'm just going to read a little bit of this because I think it really gives a better job explaining exactly, you know, what kind of effect these things have. Uh, because when you're talking about massive weights and massive speed, there's no need to have any additional sort of explosive capability. So let me read this quote. Okay, ready? This recruits is a 20 kilo ferrous slug. Feel, Feel the weight. weight. Every, Every five, five seconds, seconds the, the main gun, gun of an Everest class dreadnought accelerates one to 1 1.3% of light speed. It impacts with the force of a 38 kiloton bomb. That is three times the yield of the city buster dropped on Hiroshima back on Earth. That means Sir Isaac Newton is the deadliest son of a bitch in space. Now, serviceman Burnside, what is Newton's first law? Sir, an object in motion stays in motion, sir. No credit for partial answers, Smaggot. Sir, unless acted on by an outside force, sir. Damn straight. I dare to assume you ignorant jackasses know that space is empty. Once you fire this hunk of metal, it keeps going till it hits something. That can be a ship, or the planet behind that ship. It might go off into deep space and hit somebody else in 10,000 years. If you pull the trigger on this, you, you are, are ruining, ruining someone's, someone's day, day somewhere, somewhere and sometime. sometime. That is why you check your damn targets. That is why you wait for the computer to give you a damn firing solution. 
That is why, Servicemen Chung, we do not eyeball it. This, this is, is a, a weapon, weapon of mass, mass destruction. destruction. You, you are, are not a cowboy, cowboy shooting, shooting from, from the, the hip. hip. Sir, yes, sir. And as funny and uh, yeah, that's good. Sci-fi. This is. Uh, there was a word in the end of that caught my eye, uh, mass destruction. And also, Daniel, when you're describing these rods from God and the capabilities they have in terms of what is the equivalent force of their detonation, that sure sounds like a weapon of mass destruction. But if I go and I pull up my favorite outer space treaty. Oh, is that the outer space treaty from 1967, David? Uh, that would be the one. It was, uh, written in 1966. It was signed by a number of countries. Not every single country ratified it, though. Uh, Iran, for example, did not ratify this treaty, uh, which is important because they do have a space program, which we'll talk about a little bit. But uh, this treaty basically lays out a number of things, and it is the language it uses is so counter to that previous example where you were reading from this modern-day publication where the United States talks about their military capabilities in space, which is primarily one of communications and uh, reconnaissance, other spying tools. But But I just for a second want to take a moment to read some of the language that people were writing about space in 1966 when this was penned and give you a different sort of perspective on on the way that people visualized it. So these are people writing about the 1967 treaty or within the 1967 treaty? This is the language from the actual treaty written in 1966, assigned and ratified shortly after that. Okay. And and just contrast that with the way the U.S. military talks about space today as, as a resource to be exploited as a uh, force multiplication tool. Instead, this is how the, this treaty starts. The state's parties to this treaty, inspired by the great prospects opening up before mankind as a result of man's entry into outer space, recognizing the common interest of all mankind in the progress of the exploration and use of outer space for people purposes, believing that the exploration and use of outer space should be carried on for the benefit of all peoples, irrespective of the degree of their economic or scientific development, desiring to contribute to a broad international cooperation in the scientific as well as the legal aspects of the exploration and use of outer space for peaceful purposes, believing that such cooperation will contribute to the development of mutual understanding and to the strengthening of friendly relations between states and peoples. And th- that's the preamble. It goes on a little bit more um, to lay out uh, some information based on previous treaties that the United Nations actually set out very early in the creation of that organization as it existed in the first part. But this treaty is important for a number of reasons, because it's really laid out the rules, more or less, for what we're allowed to do in space ever since it was first signed and ratified. And uh, there's a lot of components here that are important to take apart. One is that it really focuses that space is not about sovereignty, and it's not about militarization. It's about exploration, the increasement of technology, the opening of new borders, you know, bonding uh, nations and people to each other, all, all these very positive, excited things where they, they wanted to try and use this as a global tool, not focused on war, not focused on anything, but developing a better world. And of course, uh, at the same time, you know, the space race that is going on that brought this treaty up to being a, a need was one driven by military applications, one driven by the explorations of uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles, which is where much of the initial practical experience in rockets began. As far as we are concerned, mankind's first step into the stars with the rockets that the Nazis built at the end of World War II to try and bombard nations around the world, that knowledge is what directly paved the way for the American and Russian space programs. The American programs especially, with the stealing of Nazi war criminals, stepping them out beyond uh, any sort of international uh, justice with something called Operation Paperclip and bringing them to the United States as military assets, putting them in charge of large amounts of public funding and resources in order to drive our own space program to give us a military advantage over the other nations that we saw as threats around the world, predominantly Russia. So as far as we're concerned, the very beginning of man's conquest of space, and that's a very uh, particular word that I'm choosing, is one driven by militarization. And so immediately you begin to see we have these two competing ideas of what space can be. There's the aspirational one that's written out with these words in this treaty, like Article 3, for example, here, which I'll read. State parties to the treaty shall carry on activities in the exploration and use of outer space, 
including the moon and other celestial bodies in accordance with international law, including the Charter of the United Nations, in the interest of maintaining international peace and security and promoting international cooperation and understanding. Of course, there's some wiggle room in that, those words, which I'm sure is intentional, where if you have the uh, U.S.'s view of what maintenance of international peace is, it says, let me have the biggest hammer, the biggest sword dangling over everyone's heads so they're too scared to do anything else and step out of line, a piece that the United States defines and controls. But at the same time, you know, that, that people are writing this, this words. Article 4, for example, bans any nuclear weapons or, and this is the critical part, quote, any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, which I think would include those rods of God, even though they're not conventional explosives. Well, I mean, speaking of wiggle room and literal swords hanging over people's heads, I think this is kind of one of the advantages of something like a rods of God weapon where, yeah, the treaty does say no weapons of mass destruction, but it specifically calls out nuclear, biological, or chemical weapons being placed in Earth's orbit and conveniently no mention of falling rods, right? <laughs> well, I mean, it does leave the generic term any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. But then, I mean, who's, who's going to argue in court over whether or not a tungsten rod represents a weapon of mass destruction uh, when your cities are being leveled by falling uh, telephone poles, basically? And, and, and the, the larger question is, you know, this, this treaty, you know, it is a UN treaty, but who enforces something like this? And that's the critical component of this larger conversation about space, is that the only reason that we haven't seen it turned into a complete battleground is the balance of powers, the Russia versus United States, and then now uh, with several other countries that have entered the fray and have their own launch capabilities. There's nine independent countries with their own launch capabilities, plus a consortium of other countries that have joined together and form a larger block uh, beyond that. At the time this article was written, it was really only two countries who had that capability, the United States and the Soviet Union. I said Russia a bunch, but it really is Soviet Union at the time. But I, I just really want to reemphasize this push and pull thing. Or it doesn't exist not only in, in these conversations that politicians are having, that academics are writing about, but also in the way that the public sees space, where we have on one side this vision of exploration of the first people in orbit, the first people on the moon, all these like amazing firsts for mankind, giving us back all these fantastic images and science and research that have really uh, revolutionized our understanding of everything and given us amazing tools, technology, and capabilities. But at the same time, a lot of this stuff is funded by or just developments that, that happen to occur because of initial military uses. So you see this in all sorts of things, like a lot of the telescopes and digital imaging technologies pushed by the uh, American spy organizations, and there's a lot of them. I don't want to just say, you know, NSA or something, but there are a lot of reconnaissance organizations all operating their own fleet of satellites. And sometimes you see this cross between these where uh, the U.S. has retired old satellites and handed them over to universities to use as telescopes. They say, oh, this spy satellite we were using for decades, we don't need anymore because we have way better stuff. So we'll give it to a university, and now suddenly it's one of the best known telescopes in orbit. Because, of course, that begs the question, well, what do we have that we don't know, that we don't have access to, that uh, could be dramatically forwarding science, but is instead used to be uh, giving the United States an upper hand in, in its military and consequently its economic and cultural sovereignty over the rest of the world? Yeah, that's a great point, because a lot of people talk about the need to fund space-related technology and, and advancement, right? But so much of our scientific funding now goes to military purposes. And I mean, it's great if the military develops some technology that then trickles down to all of us, you know, the mere public. But usually what it means when the military develops technology is that they get exclusive control of that. And we don't get the benefit, at least not immediately. And so much of the conversation around space has become so militarized, where the priority now in terms of the discourse coming from world leaders, is all about who controls and who dominates. Case in point, everyone has heard that Trump announced his desire to create the so-called Space Force. Yes, and he was endlessly mocked for such a ridiculous idea. Endlessly mocked, but it's not really a crazy idea, at least uh, in the logic of this current crazy uh, framework of how we think about space, right? And it's not even a new idea, I think, is important to, to push. This is not something Trump just thought up and deployed out. 
This was uh, put into effect by requests that the Pentagon wrote to reinstate a program that already existed. Right, created in 1985 by President Reagan, who started Space Command, but then it got merged with the U.S. Strategic Command. And the U.S. military has various commands. These are basically divisions within the Department of Defense that oversee some combat space, right? Like the Cyberspace Command or the European Command. And, and these will combine different factions of the U.S. military to achieve a strategic and regional goal to command some kind of battle space. And we used to have Space Command. Like I said, it was merged with U.S. Strategic Command. But today, Trump wants to create a sixth division of the U.S. military called Space Force. But in the meantime, while he's waiting for Congress to approve that, on August 29th, he went ahead and reinstated Space Command as one of 11 current U.S. combat commands. And according to Trump, quote, it is not enough to merely have an American presence in space. We must have American dominance in space, end quote. Again, contrasting that with the language that we see in that original UN charter, the treaty that everybody, including the United States, signed and ratified, which has things like, in order to promote international cooperation in the exploration and use of outer space, like quotes like that just were just completely filled with this, this treaty where it's really about how can mankind help each other versus the shift increasingly that we've seen towards how can the U.S. exploit and dominate space as much as possible. And you see that language everywhere and in seemingly every single report. The current head of the Air Force Space Command, General John Raymond, said of this plan, quote, I really believe we're at a strategic inflection point where there's nothing that we can do as a joint coalition force that isn't enabled by space. Zero. Our adversaries have had a front row seat in our many success in integrating space, and they don't like what they see because it provides us such great advantage. They're developing capabilities to negate our access to space, end quote. <laughs> and this, this is the mindset right now of our world leaders saying, well, on the one hand, we have the, the American president saying we need to dominate space. It's not enough to just be there. We have to dominate. And then we have our military saying, that's right. And every other country sees us dominating space. And so they're going to you know, try to deny us that, that right, that privilege. So we need to continue to, to build up our military presence in space to prevent anyone from uh, reducing our domination. It, it's all very much this like weird competitive zero-sum game that we're, we're, we seem to be advocating for. No hint of collaboration or, or cooperation in sight. Well, maybe this is a good point to turn the conversation to why this has changed and what those other countries, those adversaries that, that we hear in that quote that have access to space are, and why the U.S. has ramped up this conversation about increasingly militarizing space as much as possible. Because remember, when this treaty was first written, uh, that set out uh, that space should be used for cooperation, exploration, and the advancement of humanity, uh, there were only really two spacefaring powers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And since then, there are now nine countries that have independent launch capability, and then even more if you include consortiums like the European Space Agency, which no one single country is capable of launching by themselves if they were to be cut off, but collectively they're capable of fielding uh, rockets, um, putting satellites into orbit, etc. So the nine countries that have independent launch capability are, of course, uh, the United States, Russia, and China. Everybody knows those three, two of which, of course, the United States has I don't want to say bad relations with, but uh, they can be stressed. They are the other uh, large countries battling for supremacy militarily, economically, and uh, threats, according to the United States military and its, its leaders on many different levels. Uh, beyond that, we start seeing some smaller countries, many of which are close U.S. allies, Israel, Japan. Of course, the United States is heavily allied with both of these nations. Then there are some countries that have inherited the ability to launch rockets, basically because they split off. So this would be Ukraine. In this case, uh, from the Soviet Union, they still have some of that technology and that knowledge, so they're capable of fielding their own rockets. But beyond that, uh, there's a couple other countries that the U.S. has a very, what do I, I want to say here, Daniel, tense relationships with, and that is North Korea and Iran. And I don't think it's a coincidence that the fact that these two nations nations that the United States considers some of their greatest threats of any country in the world is because 
these two nations do have launch capability. Mm -hmm. And the space that the United States has seen itself as completely being able to dominate at will is now being challenged by increasing numbers of nations who might not be allied or under the uh, threat of the United States is a threat to the way that we want to dominate the world. And then uh, there's one country I left out because uh, we have complicated relationships with them, tense in some areas, very positive in others, um, and that is India. And India is an interesting area in space exploration. They're putting a lot of money, a lot of research into it, um, but also there's a sort of Wild West way of going about it that I think is probably worth talking about. And I, and I said at the beginning of this episode how some of this is a little bit funny to me in like an ironic comic way. And this is a good example because in March 2019, India shot a satellite, its own satellite, a weather satellite, out of orbit and then uh, promptly declared itself a space power. That's what I'm talking about, David. Like we live in this weird timeline where the only way our world leaders can like get into the cool parties right, is to just brag about something they've blown up in the last six months, which is what the Indian Prime Minister Modi did. They blew up their weather satellite, sending debris everywhere, which was a, a point of contention among the international community. Uh, maybe we'll do an episode one day on the Kessler syndrome, uh, which is interesting. But yeah, so they blew up the satellite and then he got on TV to say, yo, look who just became a major space power. <laughs> And, and you know, David, it really reminds me of when Bernie Krause was on the show uh, in episode 44, Do Not Disturb. And he was lamenting the fact that the United States has lost a lot of its environmental protections. And one of those was its sound abatement department. The most recent noise issue came about as a result of the Industrial Revolution about 250 years ago. And that's where it really exploded. We're looking at things right now where, I mean, again, it's an issue that the United States doesn't deal with very well, because until 1982, we had as an office within the EPA, the Office of Noise Abatement. And uh, when Reagan came into office, he wanted to ensure that a lot of these agencies would be defunded because he didn't like the regulation. So James Watt became Secretary of the Interior. And he defunded the Office of Noise Abatement, which was created to help America quiet down and to become more conscious of the effects of noise that were having terrible health effects on, on lots of people, particularly in noisy cities like New York, Chicago, Detroit, so on. Well, <laughs> when Watt was asked why he did that, his answer was very illuminating, I think. He said, noise is power. And the noisier we are as Americans, the more powerful we appear to be to others. That sounds like a uh, cultural pathology to me. <laughs> well, you know, the late Paul Shepard, who wrote this wonderful book called uh, The Others, How Animals Made Us Human, uh, remarked at one point, he said, you know, the further we draw away from the natural world, the more pathological we become as a culture. If you don't believe that, just watch the news at night. This is peace through strength, David. And uh, shortly after this televised event, Prime Minister Modi wrote on Twitter saying, quote, India stands tall as a space power. It will make India stronger, even more secure, and will further peace and harmony, end quote. Now, we here in the United States, as the driving force behind the militarization of the planet, we have to at least recognize some responsibility for the fact that other countries are blowing up satellites in the name of peace. Well, there's some funny uh, double twisting of the words there, blowing up satellites for peace to emphasize how powerful our peace enforcement capabilities are. Uh, that seems a little Orwellian, maybe, as much as I hate that word. Well, part of this also just, it doesn't make sense entirely to me, Daniel. So, I mean, in this case, India blew up very unadvisedly, uh, their weather satellite, I think it was supposed to deorbit anyway, but they decided this was a great time to test their anti-satellite missiles. And these are a tool that a number of countries have. Of course, the United States, Russia, China, India, and Israel um, being the primary systems that we know of. There are many other systems in development. Um, allegedly, North Korea and Iran are working on some, but we're not sure. And then these countries that already have systems do manufacture these missiles and sell them to other nations, so they also have the capabilities. But 
I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, of course, the United States military and all their uh, propaganda they put out talk about their incredible dependence upon space technology in order to provide the vast amounts of information technology they do and are capable of fielding in a modern day war or conflict, uh, of course, which we haven't really seen in decades of proper conflict like they imagine them playing out. But I mean, there are a number of uses that these satellites do have that are important for military operations. Um, on one hand, you see things like missile launch alerts that give them 15 to 20 minutes head start if there is an ICBM fired at them. Of course, I don't know how likely it is to see nuclear exchanges, but if you don't want those systems blinded in case, I guess, that there is an apocalyptic event going on. But even beyond that, the vast military intelligence apparatus at the United States fields is very, very dependent upon the constant ability to look down anywhere on Earth at incredible resolutions and know exactly what is being moved, how it's being moved, why it's being moved. And it, it gives us this vast insight to all sorts of things that are happening on the world at any time. Uh, and, and of course, the communication backbone that these satellites provide allow people to react or to issue orders to both individuals and electronic uh, devices all around the world. So uh, it's understandable why you'd want to attack these things. But these systems aren't something that just exists in a vacuum. They are the first or last layer of tertiary or even more systems of backups. So take, for example, a uh, cruise missile, right? So you're firing a cruise missile. It is GPS guided. Uh, and the military GPS is much more accurate than uh, the civilian use. You can be accurate to within centimeters or millimeters in the best case scenarios to get an extremely accurate hit on this target. But we know this. Uh, other countries know this. Uh, Russia, Iran. These are countries that have developed incredible GPS blocking and jamming technologies. So if you were to rely solely on GPS technology, then they would be able to block these cruise missiles or other smart bombs, whatever it is from coming in and striking something. So American military designers are aware of this problem and have also installed terrain recognition, sky recognition, various types of systems that can recognize the movement of the device, whether it's a ship, a missile, a plane, whatever, and accurately update its location to within inches uh, to feet. So you still have extremely accurate tracking capability that exists entirely without the help of any sort of electronic network or, or much less any sort of satellite network. Communications can be updated by high-flying planes. Um, these same planes, we still operate U-2 spy planes, for example. They still fly active missions uh, constantly. Uh, we have an increasing number of high-reconnaissance drones that are flying around the world. The apparatus that these satellites exist to uh, give us also exist within the atmosphere of Earth. And uh, even if you were able to take out all this stuff, you would maybe slow some of the reaction capabilities of the U.S. military, of any other military that you would happen to be attacking, whether that's Russia, whether that's China, whatever. But the fact of the matter is these countries have fought these types of traditional wars for years without this technology. And the technology to do that exists and is well refined and well capable of fighting these types of situations without the reliance on this stuff. So th that makes me wonder, you know, if you're firing missiles at satellites, you've really, you've, you're really in the, the middle of the shit right there, right? Uh, if, if you are at the level where you have to be blowing up satellites out of the sky, satellites that hopefully you, you know where they are, hopefully that you can track, uh, then you are already so incredibly fucked. I don't even understand the point of it. But say you were able to do that, you know, beyond the dangers that it provides for all the other satellites going on, you're really only threatening, I feel like, uh, civilian uses for these things because the militaries have such robust backups for these systems to go out. So then your targets become things like weather uh, satellites. Satellite communications, other technologies that are, have a disproportionate impact on consumers and civilians rather than the militaries who do have these robust backup systems. And... Uh, the whole the whole system seems crazy to me. It, it's not a flex, or maybe it is a flex. And I, I, a lot of these missiles did come from just accidentally researching uh, very accurate missiles in order to try and target ICBMs as they come into your nation. And so they have they serve a dual purpose. Uh, the Israeli missiles, for example, their primary mission objective is ICBM interception. Uh, but they also, because of that, have satellite interception capability up to a certain altitude. But at some point, it just starts to feel more like a dick measuring contest than anything else, especially because it's so obvious what happened when these attacks occur. I, I, just, I can't ever see a scenario that isn't the apocalypse where these missiles are flying and attacking satellites. 
And in that case, like, who cares if you have that capability? It it doesn't make sense to me, Um, especially with all the other research that's being put into uh, various ways of attacking satellites, which can both be from the ground to the Earth, such as these anti-satellite missiles, or from uh, orbit to orbit with uh, various spacecraft attack satellites, things like that. So maybe we could talk about some of these methods that uh, engineers and nations have designed in order to kill other satellites. If a missile won't do it, David, uh, how about just design another satellite to do it? You know, we can have assassin satellites orbiting the Earth, just, you know, casually picking off other satellites, and no one is the wiser because that assassin satellite appears to be doing something else, like uh, just a normal function. And in fact, that is kind of what's going on right now. So the U.S. and, and some other countries have been accusing Russia of secretly launching weapons into space and this is pretty interesting. In 2014, the U.S. observed what it believed to be space debris resulting from a Russian rocket launch, uh, but later saw that this debris was making some odd course changes, something that would require some kind of propulsion technology. And no one knows exactly what it is, but it's expected to be a possible weapon, a so-called inspector satellite. Now, what is an inspector satellite, you ask, David? Uh, I would assume it inspects satellites. Um, you're, you're getting there. It, basically, these are satellites that function to perform some kind of supporting role to other things in space, whether that's clearing debris for a rocket launch or conducting some kind of space vehicle refueling up there, right? But the same capabilities that make those satellites good at support also make them effective as a weapon, right? Because... Uh, A satellite that has a movable arm that functions to remove debris or uh, refuel another satellite, well, that arm could be used to nudge another satellite out of orbit. It would also be super easy to equip these types of objects with offensive tools, such as uh, little kinetic pellet projectors, light beams that can disrupt target satellites' fragile sensors, or You could put listening devices on these inspector satellites for intercepting communication. So while they go about their function, you know, going from satellite to satellite and appearing to be uh, playing a supporting role, they're actually listening in on communications like our dramatic scene from the beginning of this episode, right? So that was in 2014. Then in September 2018, France accused Russia of maneuvering its Olymp-K satellite, known for its advanced listening capabilities, super close to the French and Italian Athena Fidus satellite, which provides secure communication for both the French and Italian militaries. Then, then in November of 2018, just a couple months later, Russia launched a rocket, which was supposed to place three satellites in orbit, but the U.S. observed five total objects leaving the rocket at the peak of its journey, leaving us to suspect the possibility of more nefarious Russian inspector satellites. And if you think about it, David, it kind of makes sense why we would be so worried about these types of things because our own satellites are so vulnerable. And a simple nudge to a particular satellite, and then all of a sudden, uh, there might be a hole in our surveillance network, providing the perfect little window for a hostile nation to place something without us noticing. We can only hope. And so that's what Russia is doing over there behind the curtain. But well, this is another funny moment for me, Dino, because there are so many articles that are just absolutely panicked by this Russian uh, satellite, whatever it is. And, and there's all these, these things in the defense reports, in the mass media, and places like CNN about how uh, this very dangerous uh, satellite, which we don't know anything about, could be the, uh, the end of U.S. space supremacy, and we need to desperately figure out how to best militarize and protect ourselves from this thing. A, a satellite, again, that we have no idea what it's actually doing. It could literally just be a refueling site. Um, it's just the fact that they have this capability of adjusting their orbit easily, moving around, that, that some people find absolutely terrifying. Meanwhile, the U.S. has a program called the X-37B, which is a, it looks like a teeny tiny space shuttle, and it is an autonomous vehicle operated by the Air Force uh, that has the ability to, uh, well, it has, it has a bay that can open up. We're not entirely sure what its purpose is, but it's probably a sort of space plane satellite that can fly around and directly attack and interfere individual satellites. And so maybe we are projecting our own knowledge of what is capable in space 
and turning that into a fear of some unknown Russian thing. And again, when someone else does it, then it's a danger to uh, the safety of space and threatening the peace that exists in space. But when the United States does it, the United States has been doing it for longer, the original OG dogs in this field, with the space plane is recently up in orbit for 717 days. And that's the special thing about this particular plane is it's launched into orbit, it does its mission for a couple years, and then it comes and it lands so it can bring stuff back. It can be re-equipped for new missions. It can be updated, whatever. Uh, when we do that, oh yeah, that's just like, that's, that's totally chill. That's just how we operate in space. Space Force, baby. <laughs> and David, I definitely want to hit on that point again about the kind of moral uh, double standard that's going on with space. But I just want to point out that, you know, we mentioned earlier how when Trump announced Space Force, a lot of people were making fun of it. But it's not that unusual, like you said, for the president to be considering expansions in space. And, and we're not the only ones doing that. Now that countries are demonstrating their base prowess by blowing shit up in orbit, uh, there's a lot of other countries that have to now think about how they're going to defend their own space assets. And we mentioned the French and Italian satellite. Well, in July of 2019, the French defense minister announced France's new plans to develop a space high command, similar to the United States one, albeit with a smaller budget. And this command will be responsible for defending its satellites in orbit. And according to French officials, this is in di direct response to displays of offensive capabilities from the U.S., Russia, China, and uh, of course, India, our new space power. And you want to hear just three of some of the projects that have been floated by this new French space command, David? Uh, mind control rays, weather control systems. Weather control. David, but none of those would work because, first of all, mind control doesn't work on satellites. And number two, <laughs> uh, weather control doesn't work in space because there is no weather. No, you, you, you put the thing in space to control the weather beneath it. You can only control things downward. That's why we need more space. Well, David, specifically, I meant that France is trying to defend the satellites that it already has in orbit. And for that, uh, they're considering ground-based lasers. Okay, not that unusual. Patrolling swarms of nano satellites. Oh, we're getting fancy now. Or the tried and true machine gun mounted satellites. Da -da 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 -da. There were plans to put uh, machine guns in various space stations that were launched into orbit, but uh, they found in testing that they were too dangerous and could literally shake the stations in parts. So it, it wouldn't be unprecedented to have machine guns mounted in orbit. And I would actually be unsurprised if, if there hasn't existed and if there doesn't currently exist satellites that are armed in some sort of way like that because despite the best attempts of these treaties who the who, who can enforce a space weapon militarization whatever treaty like it's not possible you can't go up there and inspect these satellites unless you have i guess a inspector satellite you can't go up there and pull one of these satellites that break these treaties down like you don't have that capability i guess unless you have an anti-satellite missile that you're going to launch against an ally and threaten a Kessler syndrome, which if you've seen the movie Gravity, it's like that, where if we explode too much stuff in space, then it can cause chain reactions and blow up everything else in space. And then we can create a shield of crap in space, basically, that prevents us ever from getting out of orbit. Uh, and we'll talk about this in more depth in some future episode. Again, I think we'll talk about the economics of space uh, at some point, and maybe part two of this. This is just militarization. But that is a very real risk of the threat when we are increasingly militarizing space, creating these tools designed to destroy uh, satellites and other things in space. We risk denying not just uh, this individual satellite or nation their access to space, but all of humanity from accessing and utilizing this space that is supposed to be something that brings us together and allows uh, all people and all states to benefit collectively. Well, speaking of collective ownership uh, and ownership in general, David, well, one thing that we haven't touched on because this is really just about the militarization and uh, something we'll come back to in another episode is the desire to extract resources from space. This is something that's come up a lot recently as companies are all vying to gain control over valuable resources that may be in asteroids and other celestial bodies. And it's created a little bit of confusion in the international uh, community because no one can agree 
what is a person's right to extract resources in space? You know, going back to the Outer Space Treaty of 1967, it does establish that no country can colonize a celestial body or use them for military purposes or otherwise appropriate objects in space. But again, you know, there have been disagreements by governments on whether or not space mining and the appropriation of resources falls under that ban. Not surprisingly, the governments poised to be the first beneficiaries of space mining feel that the treaty does not in any way ban asteroid mining uh, in the same way that a ban on owning the ocean does not prevent nations from extracting fish in international waters. And so as a result, in 2015, the United States under President Obama passed the Space Act, which will allow American citizens and companies to own as property the resources they extract from space. And following suit, Luxembourg has passed similar laws. And then the opponents of this development include developing nations and others who believe that international rules should be established to recognize space as a shared resource that should not be hoarded by any one nation, especially not any one company. But it's Again, like you said, David, it's the wild, wild west right now. There are some treaties trying to be developed. There's groups of international law experts who are trying to draft basically what would be like a rule of thumb book on how to engage in war in space. And then people are trying to sort out, well, if you capture a space station and you take everyone prisoner, do do those prisoners, are they categorized as prisoners of war under the Geneva Convention? And all of these really dehumanizing ways of talking about war. Uh, is going on right now about space. And I think this is, this is a conversation that's not being held in a public way, right, that really engages the public enough. We, we, we have countries and companies just ready to pillage and dominate the common heritage of mankind, as it was once described. And it makes me wonder, where's the public discourse in this? Where's the accountability? Where's our ability to step in and say, hey, maybe we don't agree with privatizing space. Maybe we don't agree with uh, installing military weapons in space for the purpose of excluding anyone else from accessing it, right? Is this really a common heritage that we all share, or is it first come, first serve, might makes right? And David, if you don't mind, if I can step on a a soapbox here so that I can uh, get a little bit closer to the celestial heavens, it's topics like these that I wonder, why do we insist on dominating everything? and everyone. And and I'm sure to many people that comes across as a naive question. And I think I know what the argument is that attempts to answer that question. A Navy SEAL might say, peace requires strength. I know what a centrist would say. They'd say, if we want to pass policies, we have to work with the war profiteers, not against them. And I know what the game theorists will say, that Life and politics are zero-sum games, and if we don't build guns, someone else will, and it's better to be on top of a failing world than on bottom. And many of these perspectives start from a fundamental assumption that we are the moral standard of the world, that we can do no wrong. And so imposing ourselves on others is, by this logic, good for them, and who they are never ultimately matters. As long as we dominate space, as long as we dominate whatever, from our perspective, the world is a better place. But all of these perspectives, regardless of moral lens, also rely on this dichotomy of us versus them. It assumes that if we do not win, they will win. And if they win, we will lose. David, I wonder sometimes, are we like a schoolyard bully who has been picking fights for so long? that it becomes impossible to think along any other terms. Has our own quote-unquote strength in the form of military force on foreign soil caused so much resentment and mistrust in this world that we would rather double down and burn bridges than apologize and make amends? Our military today represents more than a third of the entire world's combined forces. Our military is nearly four times greater than China's, and it dwarfs Russia's by a factor of 10. At this point, can we really hold on to the myth that the only way to build relationships with others is to show them how big our guns are? According to uh, General John Raymond, apparently it is our great military success that provides us with such great advantage 
which has caused animosity in the first place. And from another source, here's the premise to the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency's report titled Challenges to Security in Space. Quote, the advantage the United States holds in space and its perceived dependence on it will drive actors to improve their abilities to access and operate in and through space. These improvements can pose a threat to space-based services across the military, commercial, and civil space sectors, end quote. And here's another one from the U.S. National Air and Space Intelligence Center report titled Competing in Space. Quote, after the Cold War, the United States dominated space. Over the past two decades, an emergent China and a resurgent Russia developed advanced technologies that eroded our advantage. Foreign competitors are integrating advanced space and counter space technologies into war fighting strategies to challenge U.S. superiority and position themselves as space powers. Looking at you, India. Now, and that's the end of the quote. What we're saying is that our advantages, which others are necessarily excluded from, will drive others to improve their own abilities. And that fact alone is a threat to our dominance. And believing that, our response is to kick it up a notch. Let that perspective sink in for a moment because that tells you everything you need to know about concentrated power. We hold dominance over a particular resource, a resource, by the way, that is regarded as the common heritage of mankind. And we know that by dominating that resource, others will have no option. They will be driven to improve their own independent technologies to access that resource. And that is why. In the logic of our leaders, we need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars building particle beams and lasers in space. If we truly wanted peace, we would make the first move. We would make the first move towards reconciliation and mutual support with our supposed adversaries. The responsibility for de escalating violence falls on the entity that backs the largest share of that violence. And with the size of our military, and with some 800 foreign military bases around the world, that's us. Now, last week, David, you asked us to use our imaginations to stretch our minds and visualize a better world, to imagine what a better world might look like to each and every one of us. Now, I don't have a full answer yet, but I, I think after this episode, my better world includes nations like ours who do not prioritize dominance, but rather prioritize, I don't know, life. In my better world, we don't say, oh, we're going to dominate the world. And how can we prevent others from having a share? Instead, we say, how can we help? No strings attached. And, and I know what you're screaming, all you game theorists and you centrist and you Navy SEALs out there. I'm naive. And if we let our guard down for one second, we'd be overrun. China would win. Really? If, if we, the most powerful military presence in the history of this planet, reached out our hand to other nations and offered a commitment to the pursuit of well-being for all people. We would have no allies in this pursuit if we offered to remove our military bases from foreign land and halt the buildup of our weapons, tanks, missiles, nukes, jets, satellite killing missiles, so that we could redirect our resources to making this world a better place for everyone. If we were to make that gesture, do we really believe that other nations would not stand with us and extend their hands to meet ours? Do we really believe that other countries do not desire a world where they are free from the constant pressure of aggressive U.S. military forces and free to pursue shared goals for the betterment of all people? If we chose to halt our $300 million projects for neutral particle beams in space in favor of projects to tackle food insecurity in Latin America— would no one work with us? And if we canceled the $34 billion deal for F-35 jets so we could collaborate with China to fight desertification that is ruining their agricultural land and then use that experience to assist Spain, Iceland, African nations, and our own people, would other countries respond by building nukes to attack us with? And, and, and you know, at this point, I have to admit, I think my language is a bit too vague. I keep saying we and other countries, but the reality is we makes no sense. Who is we? We the people? We have no power. We the nation? Well, what is a nation anyway? Who makes the decision to go to war and stockpile weapons? Who decides to dominate space? 
It is not we, you and me, because you and me have not had power in this world for a long time. Go back and listen to episode 79, Death Dealers. Our world is run by billionaires and war profiteers, men who stoke war and then sell weapons to both sides. Until they no longer have power, we will always live in a world where the ultimate goal is the accumulation of profit through violent means into the hands of a few number of people. So maybe it's time that we start imagining ourselves, we, the people, as an entity that has the ability to stand up against these world leaders who are hell-bent on nothing but extracting the resources of our common heritage into their own hands while the rest of us suffer the fate of climate change, inequality, poverty, food insecurity, surveillance, and I don't know, you name it. Lasers in space will not make this world a better place, but working with others to solve the very solvable and fundamental problems of our world today, to work together to make us all better off, well, let's just say that's an idea I think is worth shooting for. Set your sights high, Daniel, and maybe we can land in the stars. As always, it's a lot to think about and a lot to do, and so we hope you'll do all of that and so much more. You can find more information about everything we talked about today on our website, as well as a full transcript of this episode at ashesashes.org. As always, a lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use advertising to support this show. So if you like it and would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, sharing these topics in your daily conversations with friends and family, or go to patreon.com slash ashes ashes cast and provide a little financial support. We really do appreciate it. And we would like to thank our associate producers, John Fitzgerald and Chad Peterson. Thank you so much. Also, listeners, uh, contact us via email. It's contact at ashesashes.org. And remember, we are asking for your better world. What, what do you imagine? Whether that's uh, the way you interact with your neighbors day to day or some kind of big systemic change, what does a better world look like to you? Send us your thoughts. We read them and we appreciate them. Email is not the only way to get in contact with us. We also have a phone number where we've been taking down all your voicemails, your messages, and for our international listeners, you can just record these and email them to us. And that number, if you want to be a part of this collection, is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. We're compiling all these into an awesome call-in show, so we hope you'll be a part of that soon. Give us a call. And if you don't want to call in with us directly, you can also follow all of our updates as well as important news articles and hilarious memes on our favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast. Or join our conversation directly in our beautiful chat room with our amazing Ashes community. You can find a link to that on the website. Just go to ashesashes.org, click the community button, find the link for the Discord, and you will be all set. We hope to see you there. Next week, we're back to a chat show. And we'll hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye bye. That's a good sound. Can you make a different pitched one? No, I'd have to put water in here. But you could just shift the pitch of those. Okay, whatever. Let's go. Lead us, Captain. <laughs>